Welcome to the Power System uh, uh, Protection Lecture. My name is Pratap Mysore and today we will be talking about bus protection. A bus is just an arrangement where you have sources coming in and then the load serving lines, transmission lines or transformers connected at the same junction point in a substation. There are various physical arrangements. Let me list it down here. These are single bus, uh, single bus with a bus type breaker, there are two single bus arrangements with connected with a bus type breaker or a disconnect switch and single breaker double bus arrangements are there and double breaker main and transfer bus arrangement and also breaker and a half scheme and ring bus. Let's look at the single bus. This is the most simple arrangement where you have a source that is connected to the bus you are through a breaker and then rest of the lines are there could be sources or some other transmission lines or uh, the load serving uh, transformers can be connected to the same bus through single uh, uh, breaker arrangement. So each element is connected to the bus through a interrupting device which is a circuit breaker or a circuit switcher. Suppose the problem here is if there is a fault in the bus we lose the connection from the source to the rest of the lines. In order to prevent it you can split it into two single buses and connect it with the bus type breaker under such conditions you can always isolate only the faulted section still maintain the supply or connection for few of these particular lines. The next arrangement is um, a double bus double breaker you want it to be most reliable so you put two circuit interrupting devices on a transmission line and then if there is a problem with any of these uh, interrupting devices you can still serve the load and then uh, still connect the system to the buses through uh, the second breaker. This is the most expensive version of the bus protection. Uh, main and transfer bus, you are replacing the second breaker in the double bus arrangement with a common breaker called the bus transfer breaker. And here, the, all the uh, equipment is connected to the bus through a breaker and there is a normally open switch to a transfer bus. In case of a problem, you connect the line to the transfer bus and use the transfer bus breaker, uh, which is here for um, uh, isolating uh, faults or disconnecting that, uh, uh, that particular equipment. Uh, the issue here is you have to transfer uh, your protection, which is on that particular line, uh, line one, if you take it here, if you hope you can see the arrow here, and then to the uh, to the CTs on the transfer breaker. In the United States, switching of secondaries on the C, C, uh, switching of the CT secondaries is not allowed or it has not been a common practice. Uh, whereas this is very common in Europe, you can use the same relay but just switch the CTs so that you connect, uh, disconnect the main uh, you know, uh, breaker CT and then connect the CTs for the transfer breaker. Whereas in the United States, you put a separate set of relays and then they, they are set, or they are, you can use groups of with the microprocessor based relays to uh, select which particular line is being protected by the transfer breaker and the CTs. Ring bus arrangement is another one. If you have four elements in a power system at a bus, you can connect them and ring bus so that you can have the reliability, uh, improved reliability than a single bus. In such conditions, uh, bus work becomes a part of the protected equipment. Next one is a breaker and a half. It's just like a double breaker, uh, whereas the one breaker is shared between two elements here. So it is called a breaker and a half, where the common breaker between these two are, uh, are can be used for both line one and line two. If you look at it, why there are so many bus arrangements? As I mentioned before, if the reliability is extremely important, if it is a very critical generator or if it is a very critical transmission line serving the load in the region, it is important for us to give as uh, to have this particular line um, as reliable as possible, even inclu including these uh, circuit breakers. So it's uh, and then uh, the voltage as we keep on increasing the voltages, most of these transmission lines at higher voltages are are, are, are not just load serving but they are for transferring bulk power from one point point A to point B so the importance increases also. 
and uh, in the future of most the planners when they design a system they don't look at what is happening today they look at uh, after five, you know, expansion after five years or ten years or fifteen years based on that uh, land is purchased and then the future configuration is also planned and such initially it might start as a single bus or a ring bus and finally it might end up as a breaker and a half scheme from the cost configuration single bus is the least cost and double bus is the most expensive and so you have there is a cost benefit analysis that is done by the planners to make sure that we get a reliable system at a reasonable cost distribution bus configurations are a little different there, are, uh, there is a main bus and a tandem bus arrangement the intent here is to somehow connect the load back to the source and serve the load uh, and feeders are there are so many switches in this as you look here and you can close uh, different switches under uh, normal conditions if they are, all the switches connected to the main bus are closed so under uh, some problems with the breaker then you can go back and close the you know, switch on the tandem bus and pick up the load through a second uh, um, a breaker on the feeders so there are various bus arrangements uh, depending on what you have as a protection engineer, our primary purpose is to protect the bus. If there is a fault, we have to isolate it as soon as possible. So bus protection monitors the current flowing into the bus and out of the bus. As per Kirchhoff's current law or Kirchhoff's current law, the sum of all the currents must be equal to zero. There are other requirements of the uh, protection, bus protection relay, which is true for any of the relays. It has to be selective. That means it should operate only for faults uh, within the zone of protection and it should restrain from operating for outside the zone of protection. So this is a common term. It doesn't matter if it's a bus protection or not. It has to be the same. Uh, this should be, uh, uh, you know, this should be a criteria for all the protections, uh, uh, rear protective relays that we use in the power system. Sensitivity is depending on how uh, sensitive the faults are. And for example, under a normal condition, you might have two strong sources and you might have very high fault currents. But under contingencies, if you lose one source, it might become a weaker source. You should be able to set the relay to detect faults under weak conditions also. It has to be as sensitive as possible. Security is another term that is thrown around in the relay protective world. Uh, security means when it, is not, uh, when it is not supposed to operate, it should not operate. Uh, uh, the key is it is erring more towards restraining than operation. The opposite to this is reliable where when it is uh, supposed to operate, it should operate, but it may operate under conditions where if there is uh, when it is not supposed to operate. So it is uh, how reliable you want to be. That means it is always called, it is always operates when it is called upon and how secure it is that it will never operate, it will try to restrain if for faults uh, it is not supposed to operate. Speed of operation is also extremely important, especially in EHV systems. If you clear a fault uh, slower, then you might um, affect the stability of the system and we might lose a system. So speed and also bus faults are very high magnitude, um, the fault currents uh, are, aware, are there for bus faults and it is important for us to clear the fault as uh, fast as possible. When we said bus uh, protective relays monitors um, the current flowing into the bus and flowing out of the bus, we use current transformers. So it is extremely important for us to um, uh, maintain the directionality of the secondary current. So we use the CT polarity. The convention is when a current enters the dot polarity on the primary side, the current leaves the dot polarity on the secondary side of a CT primary and secondary currents are in phase, the magnitude is uh, reduced from the primary to secondary by the ratio of the number of turns. <coughs> the way it is connected here, I have shown a simple arrangement for a three bus system. The CTs are, uh, which are outside the protective device or the interrupting device are connected in parallel here and then the current relay is connected differentially across the terminals of the relay. So there it is, uh, the zones are defined by the CT location and also the interrupting device. 
and these zones can be fixed or uh, switchable. Uh, the reason why I have uh, made this statement here is if there is a problem with one of these breakers, we may not be able to switch this. We might be using a breaker in the adjacent, uh, adjacent to the breaker, uh, the failed breaker, and we shift our zone to the um, to those CTs on those breakers. Bus protection is called a differential relay because the relay is connected differentially. Uh, it's across the CTs which are connected in parallel. So it monitors only the differential current, difference in currents between the current coming in and then going out to the bus. Three-phase connection, it's just a good example for you on how it is done physically. You have a switchyard and then you have three-phase CTs on the bushings of the transformer, of the, of the breaker, or if it is a freestanding CT, you, it is next to the uh, breaker and then you use the three-phase CTs and each phase is connected as shown uh, in this diagram. So if you look at this, I have currents I1P and I2P coming into the bus and I3P and I4P going out of the bus serving the load or it's going to some other substation. Um, here, some of all the currents, if you look at it on the secondary side, will be zero. Primary side, anyway, it is Kirchhoff's current law and it should be zero. If the polarity is not connected properly here, there will be an unbalance and it will go through the relay. So the CT polarity is extremely important in the bus protection. So if there is a bus fault, as I mentioned here in interconnected system, the currents are fed into the fault and I1P and I2P, they were in the same direction, it is not a problem. Uh, and it, is, it remains same, I3P and I4P uh, switch directions and then suddenly the relay sees some of all the currents. So it uh, relay operating current will be I1S plus I2S plus I3S plus I4S, which is not equal to zero in this case. If there is an external fault, you have taken a close-in fault outside the zone of protection on uh, um, outside the breaker 4. So if you look at it, I1P, I2P and I3P are coming and feeding the fault and all, the fall, all these currents are flowing through the breaker 4 into the fault just outside the zone of protection. If you add these, you see that still the operating current will be equal to zero. So this is an ideal situation where there is no current in the relay during normal operation or during external fault. But CTs have some errors and also the transient behavior of the CT during faults is very different. Uh, there are DC offsets, so you might have um, the CT saturation of the cow, CT, uh, saturation, partial saturation of the CT, which is seeing the highest fault current. In our case, the, there is a fault outside breaker 4, outside the zone of protection, and it is going to see much higher currents. So there is a tend if there is a, there might be a tendency for the CT to saturate. So if CT saturates, what happens? CT is reduced primary current, secondary current without any error. This is the ideal situation. And because of the DC offsets, if it saturates, your some some of all the currents on the secondary side of the uh, CT will not be equal to zero. So in this case, let's see that there is a fault outside the zone, um, outside breaker four, outside the zone of protection. Because the CT is saturated um, on the breaker 4, it does not reproduce faithfully um, the whatever the current that was there. Still in this equation, I1 plus, plus I1P plus I2P plus I3P plus I4P, the sum of all the primary currents will still be equal to 0, but the sum of all secondary currents will not be equal to 0 because I4S, which was supposed to be sum of all three currents, is less than I1S plus I2S plus I3S. So, if you look at uh, the CT saturation, this is the same thing uh, shown in a different uh, as a single bus arrangement here. If you look at CT saturation, the one uh, in this case it is a breaker 4 CT, uh, it tries to reproduce uh, faithfully this on the secondary side. Uh, with the same ratio and then the same phase angle up to a certain point, then the CT saturates and then you see a distorted waveform coming out of this. So the blue one here is the ideal CT waveform and then uh, the black one is actual uh, secondary waveform of the CT. 
So if you look at the differential current, which is I1S plus I2S plus I3S plus I4S, and instantaneous values, you might get, uh, it, it's some, somewhat, it looks like this. Then if you take the RMS, uh, the most of the microprocessor based relays, they take uh, four samples or two samples, uh, depending, they, they use samples to calculate the effective current or the root mean square um, RMS currents uh, based on the operating principles of the relays. So it is not zero, even though the CT secondary current is uh, zero, the effective current in the relay is not zero because it is making use of samples and averaging or calculating the equivalent RMS value using four samples or whatever uh, the design of the relay is. So if you look at it, we got an unbalanced current of 70 amperes here, the peak value. Um, that this is the RMS value, 70 amperes, we got it uh, due to CT saturation of CT4. So what is the solution for uh, avoiding the CT saturation? When you look at um, uh, this particular uh, CT waveform on the secondary side, if you notice that the CT never saturates at time t equals zero, there is no instantaneous saturation. It takes time before the CT starts saturating. The other one aspect you need to know is if you go over the time, the CT comes out of saturation after a certain amount of time. So the two points which we make use of in differentiating these is uh, the CT never saturates at time t equals zero and then CT comes out of saturation after a certain amount of time. So these are two important aspects which we will use in uh, design of uh, the relay so that it can be, uh, it can detect whether the fault is within the zone or outside zone of protection. Um, the first one, let us look at uh, the CT comes out of saturation after some time delay. So the best way for us would be to delay the protection for certain amount of time so that so CTs are, uh, are reproducing the actual waveform, sinusoidal waveform after a certain amount of time because it came out of saturation. Uh, so if you can put a time delay and then trip the delay after a certain amount of time. What is the disadvantage of this? If the fault current is 50,000 amperes, you don't want it to be sitting there for 10 cycles or 15 cycles. They are uh, 6 or 10 cycles depending on how fast a CT comes out of saturation. Um, and then uh, you are unnecessarily delaying the protection, which is not a good thing. But still, this has been in uh, practice by using inverse overcurrent relays by several utilities. And then second one is, if you know that the CT is going to saturate, is there a method through which we can uh, go back and then uh, set the relay in such a way that it knows that the CT is saturated, but it will not operate for those conditions. And the third method is you determine that the CT is going, uh, has gone into saturation before it goes into saturation. For example, we know at time t equals zero, the CT was not saturated. It goes out and it comes into saturation after some delay. So if you have a criteria to determine this, then make use of this. And, and then change the characteristics of the relay or block the operating operation of the relay under such uh, conditions for an external fault. So if you look at a CT uh, saturation, we will go through some examples here. We have just taken two CTs, uh, uh, CT4 is here and then all other CTs are represented here as one CT uh, in for, for our example. And then for an external fault, the current that is produced by all the other CTs is going through CT4 and there is no operating current under normal condition, right? So now if the CT saturates, then uh, there is no inductance on the CT. It is only the winding resistance. The winding resistance is 0 0.002 uh, ohms. This is the typical value. It could be 0.18 or 0.12 depending on the gauge of the wire that is used for winding the CT and the length of the wire uh, on the, of the winding. So if you look at this, I have taken a typical example of 0 0.002 ohms per uh, turn. If it is a 1200 to 5 CT, it has 240 turns. And then total resistance of the winding on the secondary side is 0 0.48. That is 200 multiplied by 0 0.002. So 
there is a 0.48 ohms sitting in parallel with the relay um, uh, burden. Burden is nothing but its impedance value that is offered by the relay or uh, in this case. So if you look at the relay burden as 0 0.5 ohms, most of the microprocessor based relays are um, they have burdens less than 0. Point, uh, uh, then uh, 0 0.04 ohms as I mentioned it here. And then you have a, a 0.5 ohms I am assuming here in parallel with a cable that is going from uh, from the relay point in the control house up to the breaker CT and then it is going through the resistance of the breaker CT and then it is coming back to the relay point. So if you look at it, if I assume the uh, total length of the cable is 500 feet and then I am assuming that it is 1 ohm per 1000 feet. It's the number 10 AWG wire which is commonly used in the uh, United States. Uh, so if it is 0.5 ohms, I have 0.5 ohms of the cable plus 0.48 ohms of the resistance that is about 0.98 ohms that is in parallel with 0.5 ohms of the relay. So if you look at this, two thirds of the current uh, flows through the relay because if I assume 1 ohm in parallel with 0.5 ohms, two thirds of the relay of the current is going through 0.5 ohms here. and. Uh, so the relay has a tendency to misoperate under such conditions. Now, uh, uh, the, the solution is, suppose if I keep on putting some higher impedance through the relay, then I can divert that current to go through the CT for most of the times. So I have got a, a burden of the relay, as I mentioned, was 0 0.04 ohms. And then I'm putting some uh, 500 ohms here and if you go back and look at it, most of the current will now go through the CT here and most of it will not go through. So what we are doing is we are putting a resistor in, in series with the relay operating coil. So converting a low impedance uh, uh, coil to a higher impedance. This is just like an ammeter which uh, we can use it as a voltmeter by connecting some uh, resistance, high resistance in series. So if you have an ammeter, you want to use it as a voltmeter, put resistance in series and then measure the voltage. And then you can calibrate the ammeter, uh, milliammeter, uh, for example, if you have a milliammeter, the, then you can calibrate the scale as volts. So the voltage drop is directly proportional to um, uh, the current through the relay is directly proportional to the voltage, voltage divided by the impedance of the relay. So you can calibrate this relay in terms of the voltage. So this is uh, one of the solutions. We convert the low impedance of a relay to a higher impedance by putting a stabilizing resistor. So as you mentioned here, I can set it so that the voltage drop uh, at the scene at the, by, by the relay across the saturated CT and the cable, um, you know, you set it above that so that it never operates for a fault. Uh, let me take an example here. If I have 100 ohms of fault current, uh, 100 amps of fault current flowing on the secondary side of the CT, and here I uh, mentioned last time that the cable uh, impedance is 0.5 ohms, and then uh, you know, cable, uh, you know, and then the CT uh, resistance is 0.48. I can, it is almost uh, very close to 1 ohm, and for simplicity, I'm rounding it off to 1 ohm. And then I have 100 amps going in through this uh, loop. So if it is 100 amperes, the voltage seen by the relay will be 100 multiplied by 1 ohm, 100 volts. So if I set this relay to operate, pick up at a voltage which is higher than 100, we can give a safety margin of 50% or so, 150 volts, then this relay will not operate for a fault outside the zone of protection. So now if there is an internal fault, most of these uh, current relays, uh, uh, CTs, will try to push current through this high impedance and develops a very high voltage so the relay operates. So you are trying to prevent the relay operation for an external fault by increasing by putting a resistance in series called the stabilizing resistor converting the relay to a high impedance relay. Okay. So now at this time we will uh, stop and then uh, we will continue with this uh, lecture in the next uh, uh, session. Thank you.